let me say, a word in defense of reason in dialogue with faith. Because faith is that proof. Faith unites us to that substance. But reason, in order to realize its full potential, needs the horizons revealed by and truths contained in the faith. And not just any faith, but the Catholic faith. We had been married about three weeks, and I remember sitting down um, on a Saturday across the table from Scott, and I said, okay, how are you going to lead me? <laughs> he said, we've only been married three weeks. Give me time. <laughs> and he's a strong leader. So, ladies, don't get discouraged if your husband is learning how to lead you, but sometimes you got to step back to give him some space to do it. Um, now, one thing I want to clarify is that the order of authority is not a consequence of the curse. The struggle with the order of authority is a consequence of the, of the curse. Consider what Adam did. First of all, God created him first, and it is from him that he created Eve. One of Adam's tasks was to name the animals, and that was a way in which he exercised authority over all of the animals. When Eve is created, he names her. He names her, and that's an expression of his leadership. When the serpent comes, and we don't have time to go into a lot of detail about it, but when the serpent comes, he addresses Eve in the you plural. You don't get that apart from understanding Hebrew. But he's addressing both of them, which means Adam's there. And Adam should have led his wife away from temptation, but he is silent. And so husbands, I think that's a caution that it's not enough to say, well, I don't want to say the wrong thing, so I'll say nothing. You've got, to, you've got to speak. Eve not only fell in temptation, but then what does she turn around and do? She becomes a temptress. She leads her husband. And Adam should not have followed her into sin, but he does. After the struggle, excuse me, after the fall, we have a clear picture of the struggle as part of the curse that um, our Lord begins to itemize. Um, when he's speaking to Eve, he says in 316, your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. Her desire is gonna be disordered. It's going to be to dominate her husband rather than to follow his leadership. And yet he will lead but his temptation is going to be to dominate, to control, rather than to lead in love. Or as um, our Lord refers to the kind of Gentile leadership as lording authority, like the Gentiles do. And that's not what we're to be doing. Now, leading in love is not meaning peace at any price. And I just have to throw this in there because we've just had our third child get married, and, and I don't know why this saying seems to be prevailing wisdom, but I don't agree with it at all. It's um, happy wife, happy life. Do whatever it takes to get your wife happy because if you, if you have a happy wife, then there won't be any problems at home. And I think you could end up with a spoiled brat of a wife. I don't agree with that at all. I think it should be holy wife, happy life. The call is not to do whatever you can to placate your wife. You are to call her on in holiness and set an example. Likewise for wives, it's not do whatever it takes to keep him from blowing his cool. No, he is to have self-control all by himself. Okay? We are to call each other on in holiness. And in fact, in those cases in which a man will not lead spiritually in the family, Cassie Kanubi says this, in fact, if the husband neglect his duty, it falls to the wife to take his place in directing the family. I don't think that means that the church doesn't care whether or not we marry committed Catholics because the wife can always do the spiritual leadership. I think we need to have sons raised who assume spiritual leadership in their home and we need to, to let people know this is the norm but when it is not the situation in your family, it is incumbent upon the wife to at least spiritually lead the family if, it, if otherwise it won't happen. Now, we, 
we had an interesting experience. Our first year of marriage, we went to three different weddings. And in the weddings, we read this, this passage, and we'd be sitting next to each other and just kind of reliving uh, how wonderful it was to be married and, you know, seeing this couple committed. And we would end up out in the parking lot, and the conversation would unravel something like this. It would be so much easier to lead you if you would follow. <laughs> or, if you just love me like Christ loves the church, it would be so much easier to follow you. And I, I'm not kidding you, all three times we almost didn't go into the reception. We were in such a pitched battle in argument, and I have no doubt that that was the evil one, you know, planting his little seeds of nastiness, but we gave full consent, you know, and after it happened the third time, we're like, hold on, hold on, we have been here before, twice, what is going on? And we realized St. Paul does not say, wives, make sure your husbands love you like Christ loves the church, or husbands, make sure your wives submit to you. If we focus on the part that's clear that we are supposed to do, we open the heart of our spouse to do what he or she is supposed to do. And there's a reason why he doesn't say, husbands and wives set each other straight, okay? Yeah.